All right, welcome everyone. My name is Kate Namacher. I'm the Vice President of Education at NHF. Um, as you may have just heard or seen something pop up on your screen, you are at Playing It Safe and we are recording this session um, and we will be able to make it available for the community who is not able to join us tonight. Maybe all those holiday parties are starting to come back um, and folks, folks are busy. Uh, so we wanna make sure that this really um, important topic to our community is available on our website as well, which we'll get up in the next couple weeks, maybe maybe post-holiday knowing, knowing holiday plans. But we are thrilled to have um, Angie Forsyth on to talk through our Playing It Safe um, educational content. Angie helped create this book, but also really bring it to life and help um, the community better understand, you know, what, what to consider when thinking about physical activity. So with that, um, thank you so much for being here, Angie. I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Well, thanks, Kate. And thanks to NHF for the invitation. I think everyone who knows me knows how much I love to talk about this. Um, and I want to put right up front that this wouldn't have been possible without my co-author, Alice Anderson, uh, my partner in crime down there in Dallas, Texas. And um, to give you a little bit of a background on kind of how we develop this and how we um, really like to propose its use. Um, before I start, I'll let you know a little bit about myself for those who might not know me. Um, I've been a physical therapist um, working in this community for half of my life. I just realized this fact the other day, 25 years I've been working in hemophilia and bleeding disorders as a physical therapist, uh, focusing on uh, physical therapy, orthopedic complications. Um, I spent 18 of those years working in in, uh, four different hemophilia treatment centers. Um, I worked at uh, Philadelphia, both at Penn and at Jefferson. I worked out at Rush University um, doing some consults out there for a few years and also in Newark, Delaware. So I was a treating therapist in, in HTC for 18 years. Uh, the past 10 years I've been working in specialty pharmacy where I also run an education and outreach program for physical therapy. So I am an employee of Optum, but I'm coming to you as a volunteer to NHF tonight with no disclosures for that. I'm glad to see that this session is recorded, so hopefully people can take advantage of the link later. Um, for those of you on the line, I'm hoping to save some time at the end for discussion and questions, but please, as we go along, go ahead and put any questions or comments in the chat, and we'll keep track of that and be able to address everything that you want to, I'm sure. Um, you'll notice at the top of this slide that you see the www.menti.com. Um, this is where you can go using the code that's posted on this slide, and you will have access to the slide material for yourself to use. And also at the end of this deck, there is going to be a, um, three different uh, survey questions as an evaluation of the session. So you'll need to use that code to participate in that evaluation. Um, we uh, also in the chat, Kate will be putting, if, if it's not there already, um, the, the link to be able to download this uh, booklet, both in English and in Spanish. So that will be available for you to use as well. Before we move to the next slide, I just wanna briefly touch on the title. So over all these years of doing the first version back in 2005 and doing this version in 2017, um, I, I have had some discussion about the title with someone in the community who's very well known and, and very into fitness and sports. And we had a discussion because this individual thought he didn't like the title very much because he thought it meant you shouldn't do anything. You just have to play it safe in your life. So we had a long involved discussion about the title. Um, and I think we were able to come to the conclusion that that's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying is when you're going to choose to do an activity or you're choosing one with your child or something to do with your family, think about how you can make that activity less risky for everybody that's involved, not just the person with the bleeding disorder, but really thinking about each choice that you make and trying to maximize the benefits of everything you're doing. So by no means is this a way to tell you not to go out there and do things, but just to really think about it. Uh, we can go to the next slide, which is NHF's mission. And of course their mission is wonderful and I've been so happy to be a volunteer for so many years. Um, they're dedicated to finding cures for inheritable bleeding disorders, to addressing and preventing complications of these disorders through research, education, advocacy, because they want everyone to 
thrive, families and patients. And we'll go to the next. So Alice and I always try to include um, how to use this booklet when we're talking about it. And really the slides you're going to see today are just sort of a highlight or companion piece to the actual booklet. But I would like to challenge you that if you see this book in a waiting room, I would like you to look through it at your HTC, come up with questions from it. I do not want, I would not recommend that you just pick it up, put it in your bag and take it home. That is not the intent of this book. This is not a self-help guide by any means whatsoever. This is a resource and we really want you to take a look through it, look at things that are interesting to you, put down all of your questions because this is meant to be a discussion piece. It's not a standalone thing. It's not your permission to do or not do anything. It's to give you ideas to talk to your healthcare providers. So that's really what we intended it to be used for, just to kind of spark those things that you might wanna ask your PT at your center, ask your physician, talk to your nurse about your treatment strategy and make sure that you are involving that team in decisions that you're making or that you're making with your children or for your family. We can go to the next. So the good thing about this is everyone on the phone, whether you have a bleeding disorder personally or not, this book is for you. This is for all humans. <laughs> this book was developed using information from the general population. When we get down to talking about the different ratings for different activities, I'll explain how we came across those two. But anyone who's listening can benefit from information in here. You know, we're all humans. We all need to improve our cardiovascular system. We're looking at getting our muscles in top shape. We want our bones to be nice and dense and healthy, especially when we're developing that in childhood and adolescence. Uh, we want to have a self, uh, healthy weight. We want to get all those mental health benefits of being physically active. Um, you know, one of the main benefits is you can actually concentrate more if you are physically active. Um, you can have more energy. If you can get past the initial energy, it might take you to get out there and do something. Um, so a lot of mental health benefits, a lot of physical health benefits, the list goes on and on. For those who have joint bleeding issues, um, you know, we have anecdotal uh, information, we have case studies, we have some small studies that show that people who are physically fit, whose muscles are in great shape, they're flexible, they're strong, they have less spontaneous joint bleeding. So that's just, you know, one really good benefit for someone who does have a bleeding disorder. And we can go to the next slide. So if um, you guys don't know, I'm typically an adult treating therapist and Alice Anderson, my co-author was a pediatric, is a pediatric therapist. So we have both um, parts on our team. So Alice um, is really interested in this and she's seen it over her career. Kids who are active do better overall in everything. Um, and you might be able to think, you know, back to situations with your own families and your own lives where um, I can tell you, I have two boys and they're now 23 and 19, but when they were younger, if they came home from school and I made them sit down at the table to start their homework, it didn't go over very well. So I learned pretty quickly, just as a practical logistical thing with my own family, I needed to send them out to the playground um, to do something active, to walk the dog, to run around in the park before they had the ability then to come in and concentrate. So you see all the different benefits here for children who are physically active. We can go to the next. So I did mention that we're all humans. So because we're all humans, we like to put roadblocks in our ways sometimes. Um, this is what happens. Um, so in the back of this book, you're, you have an actual um, little quiz. Um, I'll show you on my camera too, so you can actually see how involved it is. It's, it's a couple of pages long, uh, but this is just one example of what is in there. So this came from the CDC years ago, and it's, it's an identification tool that we can use in our own life to say, what is throwing up a roadblock to me getting physically active? So if you just wanna answer these three questions to yourself and, and add the score up. So I'm getting older, so exercise can be risky. So give yourself a number of, of what you think in this case. The same thing for the next. I know of too many people who have hurt themselves by overdoing it or I'm afraid I might injure myself or have a heart attack. Well, that's extreme. Thanks CDC for that one. Um, so, 
<laughs> so if you score a five or above by answering these three questions and adding your numbers, then this category might be an identified barrier for you. So in the back of the book, you, you'll be able to go through all the different categories that are there. Um, so if lack of time or uh, is, is a barrier for you, you might come up with that one. Uh, lack of willpower, maybe it would be another one. Lack of resources might be another one that comes up. So it really helps you to kind of narrow down what is getting in your way when you have these goals to be more physically active. And we can go to the next. So the first part of the booklet just talks about general things that might influence someone's um, ability to be physically active. So the, the first few things are just practical tips. So we, we all know, especially in the past year and a half that we've had a lot more screen time than would be typical in our lives, hopefully. So um, we want to always be aware of that. And hopefully after this uh, pandemic has, has eased up and we're able to get back to everyday normal life, um, maybe this won't be as big of a deal. People will be ready to get back out there into the world. So we know that screen time is linked to, to bad things in our physical health. We can go to the next. I know it's really important as parents to have um, things to do to distract the kids if they have to get an infusion or get their, um, or have their, their leg resting, if they've had a bleed. Um, so it is something that we can use during this, but otherwise, um, because of the impact on physical health, we try to limit that. So there's a lot of information on, in, this, uh, in the book about this, just giving practical tips. Um, we can go to the next. One of my favorite topics. So I think a lot of times we might neglect talking uh, to our patients who have more mild or moderate disease. And we focus a lot on people with severe disease. We see them more, we have a lot more interaction. We see more injury, more bleeds. But um, I always like to mention this and highlight it. This booklet is for all humans and it's for people who have mild and moderate disease as well. You'll understand this more when we get to the end and talk about the ratings. Um, but in my career as a PT, especially working in clinic for 18 years, um, sometimes we see the biggest problems in our patients who have more mild, mild or moderate um, diagnoses. And that's because they don't have as many bleeds and they might not recognize a very early sign of a bleed. And when they come in, it might have already extended or become more complicated. So Activity choice is still really important. Trauma can happen to anyone. Accidents can happen to anyone. And especially if um, the accident or injury in a sport or activity is too severe to have that person's mild or moderate um, factor levels take care of that, of that disease, then, then that bleed, then we want to make sure um, that everyone knows and is well prepared for everything that they might have to go through. So please feel free, um, whoever wants to use this book can use this book. Um, we might be running into this sort of um, challenge more in the future as treatment products get more, um, you know, that they're, they're very good and, and it's hard, you know, returning up uh, obviously we want this to happen. We want people to have less bleeds, but in effect, people are becoming more mild in how they appear with, with hemophilia. So we still need to discuss what a bleed looks like, when to call your treatment center, and when to discuss any signs or symptoms that you're having. Uh, we can go to the next. Angie, I'll just chime in from something from the chat. Thank you. There's a, a thank you from the chat because um, someone sharing as a person with as a woman with mild factor eight, it, that it's been hard. There's not as much support always for women, right? And so determining, you know, is it a bleed? Is it arthritis? Things like that. So yeah. um, that's great. And I saw micro bleeds pop up. That did come up on my screen briefly. So thank you yeah. for that. Um, yeah. So all of us, anyone who's listening to this, whether or not you have a bleeding disorder, we have bleeding in our bodies all the time. We have it in our muscles as, as we rebuild them when we're doing exercise, when we're doing strengthening, we have these in our joints. If we've kind of tweaked something when we get out of a chair or, or take a jog, um, those who don't have a 100% intact coagulation system can ha obviously have more severe and lasting bleeding complications as a result. Some of these are micro bleeds and 
by definition, that is just you know, a bleed that's not clinically recognized by someone doing a physical examination or by the person themselves. We can see the effects of these micro bleeds when we do diagnostic imaging, but the person may not have realized it happened and the practitioner who's doing the physical exam might not have um, been able to overtly um, see that as well. So thanks for that. Um, the next couple of slides just talk about brief things with age ranges. And I won't go through all the details in this, but I wanted you to see what's there. So we have a section on infants and toddlers um, and talking about what's important in that stage of life. Obviously we want to encourage movement. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a story uh, briefly about, um, about a, a child that I met in another country that was a developing country and, and didn't have treatment available and very limited options for treatment. And the mom thought she was doing the best for her son by keeping him all the time in the umbrella stroller. So in, that, in the soft stroller and just not letting him sit up, not letting him walk, not letting him experience anything. Um, and when I met that child and, I, and, I, and he was four years old at the time when I put him on my lap, he couldn't sit up because he hadn't been allowed to explore his environment and go through normal development because his mom was truly afraid for his life because treatment wasn't available. And in the end, I, I visited with him again two years later. Um, they had gotten some relief with some factor and she let him you know, start being a kid. And he walked over to me and gave me a hug. So this is the, the thing that we wanna make sure that we are providing the best education for our the parents that we're trying to help um, so we can help them help their kids to have a normal um, everyday existence and, and explore their environment and grow. So you have um, a section on infants and toddlers and the next section is on preschoolers on the next slide. Um, so just some some things of you know highlights about preschoolers you know they're going through different motor learning skill um, area. So they're learning how to catch and throw and hop. Um, they might be on the playground. So there are things to think about in terms of safety with that sort of thing. Um, and very young kids start playing sports. So it's something that you might be talking about with a four or five year old um, at, at their level with playing sports. Um, we can go to the next. The next two slides are gonna talk about school-aged kids. So things change a little bit, um, as obviously as children get older. Um, they're, you know, they're in classrooms, they're developing their self-esteem. They might be working in teams in the classroom and also in sports, uh, might have more input or more interest in different activities. So this is a time when you'll probably start including them in the discussions that you have around activity. And of course, a big part of that is going to be safety. Um, on the next uh, slide, you'll see some tips for safety. So really working with uh, people at the school making sure that everything is as safe as possible in terms of physical education classes or intramural sports that um, they might be involved with. You know, then you run into the planned activities versus things that just happen. You know, someone's having a birthday party and they have a bouncy house and you didn't know that before you dropped your child off or things like this. So it's a matter of just being aware of all of those different things that might come into play um, in kids this age. We always say that activities and sport may be safer as children are younger and may become more risky as um, they get older. The reason that we say this is that normally, I think back to my own kids, you know, playing soccer as four and five year olds. And I um, very affectionately refer to it as beehive soccer. So you have a ball and you have the kids on the field and they're all following the ball and no one's kicking anybody or pushing anybody or tripping anybody or, or heading the ball into the goal at age four or five. They're just all following the ball. But then as in that sport, as it gets more competitive, as kids get older, they start playing travel, then it's a different story. So you're, you see the slide tackles, you see the heading of the ball, you see the elbows flying. Um, so, you know, some sports obviously that are a team sport, are more unpredictable and they, they get uh, more competitive and more physical as time goes on. Uh, we can go to the next. And the other thing that, you know, that might not be evident these days with some kids because they haven't had as many bleeds and their joints are in such better shape, you know, that is really wonderful for us to see. Um, 
but if those people who already have some joint disease, have had an injury, maybe have had a surgery, there are still things that we can help you to get active with. So there's gonna be a choice for everyone. There's adaptation, there's modification, there is preparatory work that you can do with your physical therapist. Um, and these are the things you wanna consider before you start um, the activity. Um, on the next slide, we're talking about organized sports or pickup games. And normally we put this in here as a question and we try to trick all you guys, but you know, you're pretty savvy. So um, we want you to say that pickup games are less dangerous, um, but probably you've heard us talk about this so long, pickup games are actually more dangerous because you know there's not a coach there, there's not a referee there. There might not be um, a very well-maintained um, athletic field or court available. Um, you might not be wearing that safety gear that they're gonna make you do if you're in an actual organized sport. So in, in general, we tend to support more of the organized sport because we have more control over the environment and that can provide some more safety. So on the next slide, we're really just talking about preparation. So any of us, we need to prepare. You know, the whole weekend warrior thing is not something we should aspire to be. We should try to be prepared. And um, those with bleeding disorders, be prepared. What's gonna happen if you, if you have something go wrong? So, you know, telling that it's a bleed, is it just an injury? What am I gonna do? What's the plan? Um, have all that stuff identified beforehand. It just, it gives you more protection. Uh, we won't talk about this and, and you have a lot of resources for this through NHF, but talking about disclosure. So making sure, um, you know, if there's not a medical alert brace, bracelet or other means, what is what does the school know? What does the coach know? What does the school nurse know? Making sure that in those situations, kids are as safe as possible. Um, the next couple of slides just talk about general conditioning. So these are the things that we do, even if we're playing tennis, okay? It's not just playing tennis, but it's making sure that our muscles are in good condition, we're flexible, that they're strong, um, that we have a good cardiovascular system, that we're able to develop those skills um, that are sport specific. So we want to have a good conditioning program along with whatever activity we're choosing because that is going to make sure that we're uh, taking care of the mechanics of our body. We're doing things with proper technique because if we don't do things with proper technique and we don't stretch and we don't warm up, then we're just asking for injury. And that, that's all of us. But unfortunately, injury in someone with a bleeding disorder could equal a bleed and that equals time on the bench. So we don't want that. On the next, we're talking about strengthening. Um, you know, strengthening can be lots of different things. Uh, we had some, gosh, we had some talks early on in the pandemic. We were talking about what you could do around the house to, you know, stay active and stay strong. Um, you know, you might benefit from a physical therapy evaluation to take a look at muscle imbalances, what muscles might be tight, what muscles might be weaker than others, because those are the things you can focus on in a strengthening program. Strengthening can happen with weights. It can happen with the weight of your body. It can happen with resistance bands or resistance tubing. It can happen at the gym on some, on some equipment. So there are so many ways to do strengthening, um, but I always encourage people to get an evaluation, get some personalized instruction because you want to always maximize your benefit of this while you're minimizing the risk of what might happen if you're doing things a little bit off. Um, on the next side, of course, we're talking about um, factor infusion. Um, actually, oh, sorry, I missed one. Yeah, we're talking about your family situation. So everyone's different. You know, I don't like vanilla ice cream. I prefer um, moose tracks. So you might like a different kind. So everyone's different. Everyone's an individual. You pick the thing that's going to fit in your situation. Um, I will tell you that um, exercise and fitness are better when done as a group or with a friend or with your family, that gives you some motivation. You have an accountability partner for some things. So it is a good thing to discuss as a family if you're able to participate in something together. Of course, um, you'll see in the ratings that things that are individual activities usually carry lower risk than things that are team activities. And that's just because we can't predict what the other players are gonna do. That, that adds a lot of uh, variation to the risk of the sport. Um, and on the next one uh, that I, I tried to get to sooner because I was so excited to talk about it. Um, this is one thing that's going to be 
really different these days. So factor infusion plan A is going to be really different. It's going to look really different than it did in 2017 as we're sitting here in 2021 because products are so different, especially with, um, with emicizumab and the injectables. Um, this will be different. And this is another thing that you want to talk to your treatment team about. Um, used to be a little bit easier for us as physical therapists to understand when someone was getting their infusion, we could of factor products and we could tell what is their trough, what is their peak, when are they most protected, when are they least protected. We could give them more customized um, advice to them on when they should do the toughest or um, you know the activity that was most strenuous for them. Uh, nowadays, it's a little bit different, so it's going to require your treatment team to put their heads together with you to make sure that you're safe and well protected. Um, on the next slide, if a bleed occurs, you know, have that plan. You can't, I, I like to say this, this, I put this on this slide for a reason, because everywhere I go, I inevitably get someone who says to me, I took my factor, I'm fine. I can do whatever I want to. So I'm here to tell you, unfortunately, that we cannot prevent 100% of bleeding at all. That is a scientific fact. Uh, we can't prevent the bleeding. We can treat the bleeding much better than we used to, but we cannot prevent it. All of us have the anatomy that allows us to bleed in our joints. Um, in fact, I've had a joint bleed. I tore uh, my ACL, which is a ligament in my knee, jumping over a fence to save my neighbor's cat. Now the cat was fine, but I was not. So I had a knee full of blood. Um, I don't have any bleeding disorder. So even me with an intact coagulation system had a knee full of blood that my friend, I, I use that term loosely, the orthopedic surgeon was happy to pull out with a needle. Um, so even with our advancements, we can't prevent bleeds. So factor or um, medication of any kind is not that magic shield. And we want people to realize that because you know, there's a right place and a right time for sport and exercise. That time is not after a healing bleed because we don't wanna encourage those complications of blood and inflammatory processes in the joint from making the damage get worse. So there is a right time and a right place for exercise and it's, it's not after a bleed. So taking good care and making sure you recognize a bleed. We can go to the next. So again, having a treatment plan. Um, following the treatment plan of your provider, making sure you have that plan up front in place before the activity even starts. So you know what, what's going to happen if there is something that kind of goes wrong. Um, the next two slides are going to talk about specific things. So the first is ankle sprain. So ankle sprain might not be, might not just be an ankle sprain. So it's kind of hard to tell initially, you know, sprains look the same as bleeds in terms of being swollen and, and warm to the touch and seeing possibly bruising. So you have to always think that if something um, such as a sprain happened, there's probably a bleeding component to that. So it might be a little bit different in terms of healing time. It's the same thing with concussion, which is what you'll see next. We need to be really careful about those activities that have the risk of concussion because there is the added risk of bleeding. And of course, we know that central nervous system bleeding can be life-threatening. Obviously, we wanna be well aware of the risks of that. Um, in fact, that's why a lot of uh, the activities get into the higher ranges because there are more risk of head injury in those activities. So we'll go actually into um, the sports section next. Um, so there are lots of things that can cause sports injury. <laughs> so we wanna make sure that whoever's participating is in the best shape they can be before they start. There's a, a lot of things we can do in terms of technique, um, playing, on, um, playing on fields and courts that are well-maintained making sure we're well hydrated, making sure we have the proper nutrition, taking care to realize what the weather might do to those things, um, playing while hurt or tired when you're more likely to injure yourself. So just kind of stacking the deck in your favor so that uh, you're able to, to, again, maximize those benefits, minimize the risks. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the ratings. I've been talking all day, so sorry for my drinking water. <laughs> so, when Alice and I first developed the booklet um, in 2005, we wanted to change the 
the way this book looked to have different continuum of risk across the different activities. By the time we came to the, and we, and we gave it a hard number. It was a one, it was a two, it was a three in the old booklet. So some of you might still have this one floating around. If you want to look at my camera, you guys still have this one floating around. This is the old one and it is a little bit different. Um, it was very, um, very hard and fast for the number. When we came into this version, you know, the way we developed it was we looked at the literature that's out there in the general population. We had a room full of journal articles printed out and strewn about for different activities and sports. Um, reading through those articles um, ha after having done the liter liter um, lit review search. And these were in people in the general population. So these people did not have a bleeding disorder. What we were looking for because it doesn't exist, right? And people with bleeding disorders, we don't have this literature. So we're looking in the general population and we're seeing what are the types of injuries that are most prevalent in all of these different sports and activities that we're gonna show you coming up next. And, you know, some sports had more risk of fractures. Some sports had more risk of head injury, some more risk of soft tissue or strains uh, or sprains. Uh, that were more prevalent. So that's kind of where we, you know, we put that all together to give you the ratings. And if we go to the next slide, um, actually we can even, yeah, we're good at level one, perfect. Um, and I think we'll see it coming up, but I'm gonna show you my copy again on my camera. So we took those hard and fast ones, twos and whatever, and we gave you a continuum, okay? of what was, what could be green and go the whole way to red. Because we realized that, um, you know, everything is not in the same category. So just because something is labeled a green color from one to 1 1.5 does not mean you can't hurt yourself doing it. So you heard that here first, just because it's green doesn't mean everyone should or could be doing that right now. It's not risk-free, nothing is risk-free. Um, so if I'm going for a, a walk, I'm not even going to use hiking. If I'm going to go for a walk, I can choose to walk on a busy street. I can choose to walk on a very well-maintained walking trail. I can choose to wear flip-flops or I can choose to wear proper shoes. So even within that level one, um, you know, supposedly safe activity, you can have the ability to make it safer or make it more risky. So that's really what we want people to think of when they're thinking of an activity or a sport. Not to discount that you can't do it at all, but how could I do this to make it safer for me? How could my child have a, a safer and less risky experience? So this book for us is about thinking. So it's not about us telling you what you can and can't do and what is safe and what is not safe. It is about a discussion. So just keeping that in mind with each level. So if you look at the next slide is level two. Again, um, these activities generally are the ones that you're with other people. The level ones generally are the ones where you're an individual activity, individual sport. You control your body. You control how fast you're gonna go. You control how long you're gonna play um, or how long you're gonna, you're gonna participate. But these generally are the team sports. They inherently are gonna be in the middle in terms of risk because of the other people that you have to engage with. You know, if I'm just taking a walk on a trail by myself, I have much less risk um, than if I'm playing basketball and someone is trying to block my shot. <laughs> and, and in the course of blocking my shot, they push me to the ground. So that's, that's why team sports generally are gonna be in level two. Um, these are also, you know, a lot of times you really need to focus on being in a well, coached environment um, where you have a lot of input in terms of getting ready for the sport, getting ready for the game, having someone moderate that and keeping you as safe as possible. <clears throat> we move along to the next, you're going to see my personal favorite um, that I get yelled at around the country because of what's on this list, um, level three. So I'm going to tell you, well, I have a thick skin, so it's okay. But in level three, the reason that things are a level three is that me personally with no bleeding disorder, 
I could go out and I could do a level three activity and I could have a, a life-threatening injury as a result. These are the sports that have the most contact, that have the most impact, that have the most serious um, injuries like concussion or fracture that are associated with them. And that's just from the literature. That's not my personal opinion. <laughs> that's, from, that's from stacks and stacks of research articles. Um, because that is the nature of the sport with contact with other players, with equipment. Um, so these have the highest percentage of injury and that's why they're level three. So we can go to the next. So how do we use this? So we use the ratings just to give people an idea of what's involved in that particular activity or sport. So in general, things are in the, that are in the ones or twos typically the benefits of participating are gonna outweigh the risk. Um, when you go through the book, you're gonna see each activity described, and then you're gonna see um, an, an overview, some of the risks that are associated and some of the safety measures that are associated. I'm sure that we could make a more exhaustive list of all these, and I would encourage anyone who's actually looking at a particular activity, sit down with your family, with your kids, with your treatment center, and talk about what you think. So we can go to the next. So I showed you already, this is how it looks now. They're not just little blocks that say one or two, but to realize that you have choices to make when you pick an activity, um, how risky or how safe it's going to be for you. Um, there were some updates um, from the previous version and we won't spend a lot of time on this. That's in the next slide. So we were able to actually um, take some differences in how um, these activities looked so from the research that was out there. So upper range, so bicycling, bicycling can be a level three. If you're doing cyclocross and you're doing some tricks on your bike, then it's not the same as riding on the rail trail with your helmet, of course. Um, there are also extreme kinds of dance that are now more popular. So that actually had an upper range that went up to a three. Same for gymnastics and martial arts and also soccer, just because of the risk of concussion being so prevalent in that sport um, in high levels of competition. So on the next one, when I'm in a room, I will ask everyone to give me the answers to this, but you guys get the answers right there and I can't ask you. Um, you know, you think fishing can be pretty benign. If I'm standing on the shore, pretty benign, right? If I'm fishing for little sunnies or, or something small in a lake, might be pretty benign, might be a one, not much risk. But if I'm standing on a boat and the deck is wet and I don't have great shoes on and I am, gosh, what's a big fish? I am fishing for a swordfish or something. <laughs> then it's gonna be a lot more risk involved um, in, in those choices. So just to show you that um, you make these choices. Um, on the next, you're gonna see um, activities that we added. So as we all know, we're inundated with new and improved ways to exercise and, and activities that are out there. So we added some of those to this version. I am perfectly sure there are more than this out there now that have come into, um, into more uh, common use out there uh, with the trends. So these are some of the things that we added because they were becoming more popular in 2017. On the next one, um, we actually made some friends in the community <laughs> because due to the research review, we were able to lower the less risky range on all of these activities. So before they had a higher risk, you'll see the new and the old scores there. Uh, we were able to bring it down. So a lot more things looked a lot safer. Um, and that's just because of, of the, the innovations that have happened in safety year um, and that sort of thing that allow injury to become um, more controlled, which is definitely what we want, especially um, when we're wanting people to be more active. Um, the next two slides are gonna talk about level three. So this, I agree, Lena, woohoo for rock climbing. I loved that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
This is the old list of level three activities. So I always dreaded going onto a podium and talking about this, depending on where I was in the country, whether I was gonna get booed off the stage for football or booed off the stage for wrestling or for rock climbing or <laughs> for trampoline. So it was, um, it was not the best experience sometimes, but again, these were there because of the risk of injury. So guess what? On the next slide, you're gonna see, we don't have solid threes anymore. These. All of these came off the solid three. Now they have the relative risk, like everything else, and you can make it safer, you can make it more dangerous. <laughs> so, um, and this is all due to the research that is out there. Again, all due to safety gear and following proper technique and getting instruction in, in these sorts of things. So we were so happy to see that rock climbing actually is can be a very, very safe activity, especially if you're using all the equipment. If you have all the harnessing and you're belaying someone, you have your helmet, um, proper gear, it made us very happy that that was coming more into play. So um, the next couple of slides are just gonna show exactly what it might look like in the book. Um, so I won't read this to you guys, but what you'll see in these examples is we talk about what all is involved with bicycling. What is the overview? Um, is it a lifespan activity? Is it better for certain ages? So, so you'll see age ranges in here and you'll see how um, we have described it. Again, this is not exhaustive. This is meant to be a discussion piece. So see what applies to you, see what doesn't. Um, see how you might be able to participate. Look at the risks in there. So bicycle risks, of course there are risks. You're riding in traffic, you're not riding in traffic. You're wearing your helmet, you're not wearing your helmet. You don't have well-maintained equipment or you do. Um, you're doing it socially or you're doing it in a group. Um, so there are so many variables to every activity that you have control over. We just want you to be aware of what those are and really think about your choices for each one. So that's how you're gonna see everything. So I'll show you just an example next of running. It's laid out the same way to, um, to, to talk about what the benefits are, what the risks are, how it might be incorporated in other activities or sports. Um, and the final one I think is yoga, which is next. Um, you can modify, a lot of these activities are great and you might not realize it till you read through if you're interested in something, you can modify them to be very easy. I mean, I can do Shavasana all day long and I have no risk, right? <laughs> Add a couple of down dogs and there's still not much risk. But if I'm doing an, another kind of yoga where I have to really get involved, um, then it's much different on my, on my muscles and joints. So um, there's so much out there that you can do. I just encourage people to use this as a conversation starter. Get your basic information, see what you might wanna try, use it as a menu. Um, the next one is activity choice and how we discuss this. So um, this is a very boring way for me to put it up on the screen, but these are the questions that you might wanna ask. Um, so, you know, in, in talking to your family and talking to your kids or, or putting it down there for yourself, um, if, you're, um, if you're able to do that. So looking at these questions, but the thing I, I really like to show you is a very old tool, but it's, um, was authored by a dear friend of mine, Sherry Herman Hilker, um, out in Michigan. She used it with her patient. She developed it. I think it's a, such a good idea, especially for um, your school-aged kids to get really involved in decision-making for themselves. So I have some screenshots of her tool we've used with permission. I just love it. So this gives, this gives children a lot of ownership and um, involvement in their own care. So you're just going through this little tool and they're answering these questions on their own or, or with the help of a parent if they need to. Um, obviously some of this stuff might need to be updated if you were to use it now because of the different treatment um, options that we have available. But it's so nice that, that you know, the kids can really get involved and you know, feel good about their participation, even in the planning process and, you know, making that step to independence that we want them all to have. So, you know, they're talking about their disorder. They're talking about um, what joints give them trouble, if, if, if any, and they talk about what they might use at home, like an ACE wrap. Um, so on the next page, they, um, they're answering more questions. So it makes them problem solve. So what do I want to play? Okay, well, what's my category? Well, what's my activity? what might be good for me, what might be risky for me. So they really have to think about it. 
and again, this is giving them, you know, an actual tool rather than just reading the book um, and then coming up with your own questions, but it's kind of a step-by-step -step that goes about it. Um, really talking about how to make things safer for themselves. And on the last page, um, it's just showing, um, you know, their evaluation. So like if, if they have pain, they can write that down. Um, they can even do more planning about their sport or activity. So I, I really love that Sherry did this. And I think it's a super tool for people to, to really have to think. And um, I would love to see this used more because I, I loved using it back when I was treating in the HTC. So the last, um, the last is a summary. So, you know, we went through this stuff pretty fast, but I think the main goal that I would like to impress on everyone is, you know, just talk about this stuff. Um, you know, we've all heard the horror stories, those of us who worked in centers, of people sneaking around to do things behind us coming in with an injury. I'd rather just support you. So come on in, let's have a talk about it and get you all educated and prepared. Um, lots of benefits to participating for your physical and mental health. Um, and parents have a huge influence over their kids. And, and if you can be active as a family, that's even better. Um, and it's all about your choices. So this, this is meant to be you know, a tool that helps you choose how to make things safer, not to not do things. <laughs> so um, I think the evaluations are coming up next. Um, after this, but first we'd like to thank all of the sponsors. So without all of these sponsors, this education series would not be possible. Um, so it's wonderful to have so much support in the community and to be able to provide so much education. I believe there is one more session next Tuesday that my good friend and colleague Cindy Bailey will be offering at the same time. So I hope you tune in for Cindy as well. Um, on the next slide, I think you're gonna use your Mentimeter. Yes, okay. So you guys, you have to go to menti.com and you use the code that's there. And then you're able to then answer um, how you agree on these. The topic was relevant to me. I have a better understanding. I learned a new skill. So you pick the one that is, you're gonna pick your um, disagree to agree on the scale for each one of those. We're not showing the results. So you can say that I was terrible and I won't see it, it's fine. So I'll give you a second to fill that out. We have these, uh, we, we use this at work, by the way, and they always show the results. So then we're all feeling terrible <laughs> when we're seeing the slide. You're going to have three of these. This is the first out of three. Um, this is where you get to have a main takeaway. You're going to just put that um, in here, whatever, what your main takeaway from today's presentation was, you can type that in. And then finally, any additional comments that you would like, and they will not be displayed on the screen. And I know um, we are going to take the questions. There's been a bunch in the chat that we'll make sure that we cover. But truly, from the NHF's perspective, if there's other topics around joint health, pain, mobility, any of these things, please add it into this question. We'd love to really hear from you as we go into our 2022 planning here right around the corner and make sure we're addressing community needs. So please feel free to give as much detail as you want. <laughs> And I will open it up for questions. And I would encourage you guys, um, we could take the screen down and you guys can come on camera and I can see you. I know some people out there. I'll call on you. <laughs> so if you wanna come on, if you wanna ask any questions, um, I can go through it. If you wanna go through the chat, uh, do you want me to look in there? Or Kate, do you have a list? Yeah, there was a question um, and I'll just go back through a couple of the old ones and please folks feel free to chime in. There was a question on what are the best diagnostic tools to detect bleeds and milds? Is it different than non-milds or how, how can people go about that or work with their providers to go about that? Awesome. Yeah, that was my question. Hi. 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 That was my question. <laughs> okay, so diagnostic tools. Um, I mean, if you're talking about point of care, musculoskeletal ultrasound, that's obviously a tool that can be used to detect um, bleeding. And I believe that's Cindy's topic uh, next week. So you can, you can learn more about that directly from her. Um, the diagnostic tools that I was 
referring to with microbleeding is, you know, unfortunately we see the effect of joint disease. So way back to the landmark study of the joint outcome uh, study, we, you know, had people in that study that never reported a clinical bleed, yet when they looked at those uh, patients' MRI, they could tell that, that yes, indeed, they did have joint disease. They did, they did have results of bleeding in their joints, even though they never reported bleeding. So the diagnostic tools would be the same. We, we obviously wouldn't want you to get to the point where you already have damage in terms of finding that out. Is there any way to determine in a joint what might have been caused by joint bleeds or just senior arthritis? That's a really tough question, Priscilla. Um, so in the end, the pathology is completely different, right? What causes a bleed. But in the end, the way it looks in a lot of cases is very hard to discern. Unless you're seeing active um, hemosiderin staining or um, evidence of, of blood at the time, the actual damage, if I showed you an x-ray right now, if I showed you an x-ray, no one would say this happened from hemophilia or this happened from osteoarthritis or even this happened from uh, rheumatoid arthritis in some cases. So the end result looks similar. Uh, the pathology is completely different. So I don't know, um, if Lena, if you want to jump in, do you have any input on that one? I'll be happy to jump in. Sorry, I have my Christmas background on here. Um, so uh, a, a little bit more on the musculoskeletal ultrasound very quick, because that is really a tool that has been moved more and more into practice, not just for bleed detection, but really to follow joint health longitudinally. So with the ultrasound, we actually have the possibility to discern a little bit more of what we are seeing there. So we can actually follow over time, whether or not there's still cartilage there, we can measure the cartilage. Um, we can follow the osteochondral surfaces. So the bony destruction that is going on. And then we can also see any of the um, soft tissue development as well that is happening in a joint. So we can we have developed a whole protocol of how we can measure that so we can follow it longitudinally. So we can actually follow joint health. So we can see if it gets worse, if it stays stable, if something else is happening. Um, but as Andy said a little bit earlier is you cannot differentiate in that very moment if you're just purely looking at an image if this is just um, osteoarthritis, hemophilic arthropathy, or if it is rheumatoid arthritis. Now, what you have to put in consideration then here is the whole clinical picture. So what is the underlying disease process that this person has? Now, if we do know that a person has a bleeding disorder and they have reported bleeds or um, have reported pain, something out, then obviously the logic conclusion would be that we are looking at hemophilic arthropathy. And depending a little bit on the age of the person too, and, and kind of what era they were born in, were they born in an era where they had access to a recombinant factor, where they had access to prophylaxis, or were they of that generation that was born before that time. So then um, sometimes the joints are so destructed, we don't see that amount of destruction in somebody with osteoarthritis. So it might still be a destroyed joint, but it might be so bad that we can clearly say like, okay, this is really truly happening from hemophilia or another bleeding disorder in that, in that instant. I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but musculoskeletal ultrasound is really one of the best tools that we have clinically right now um, that we can utilize to detect bleed, but to also quantify and follow joint health longitudinally. I think that Priscilla is coming from the area of, um, it's oftentimes more difficult for women to- mm -hmm. Oh yeah have the same recognition, let's yes. say, for joint disease. So, you know, is this just because I've gotten older because I have wear and tear, or is it because I've had these micro bleeds and real bleeds that I've seen, um, you know, all my life? So it's, it's, a, it's a struggle I know in that situation to, to really have the recognition that this was caused by hemophilia. Well, you know, yes, women absolutely. weren't even recognized as hemophiliacs in any realm until the 70s, maybe, and I'm a senior citizen and I've got 
massive joint. I'm facing a knee replacement, injections in my spine, injections in my bursa, uh, ankle. Okay, so I was never even treated. And now this is showing up and then the doctors say, oh, that's just normal aging. So the question is, when these joints swell as they are now, and they didn't before, should I be treated or shouldn't I? That, that is the question of the hour. They never heard of microbleeds. They <laughs> never a, heard yeah. of microbleeds. Yeah. 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 And some doctors still don't believe there are microbleeds. Am I well, right? Priscilla, they are keep happening. <laughs> yeah. So this is, sorry, Kate, I know you unmuted, um, but this is something that we have seen in PT so many times too, where women are not getting acknowledged and you are unpacking there is something that we are trying to advocate more out and and that we try to gather more data and and really support that argument so um yeah i think i think and you said it great with i keep advocating we have a long way to go we have gotten yeah. to a better place but we definitely have a long way to go and we are marching forward on that path um and we need people like you we need your stories your experiences to um share so that we can help advocate for this and and for other people to come and other generations so that they will not have your experiences so um well, yeah kate i know you want to i have to say if i had not had this severe back grade son that i raised and started infusions at home at two years of age, I would not know what a bleed right. looked like or felt like. And I know when in doubt, you treat. But as a senior citizen female, you can't get that by them. They never even heard of microbleeds. Well, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think the other piece of this is, um, you know, healthcare provider um, education and training, which our healthcare provider team does a lot of that as well. So like Lena and Angie mentioned, things are changing for women um, and throughout the lifespan. And we're really trying to do more research, but also more education, both for, you know, the community members themselves, but also healthcare providers. And it does, it does take a while. Um, and, and find those advocates, find those providers that are your advocate and have them connect with other providers, right, to, to help um, make the case and get you the best care. Um, with that, there is one more question in the chat, and then we can also open it up if there's any other questions. Um, of course, now did I just lose it here? Hold on, I'm, I'm scrolling. Oh, yes. Um, Tom shared that um, it says, my right knee doesn't bend 90 degrees since a total knee replacement. I want to ride a bike and can't bend my knee that far. Any suggestions? Physical therapy. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, you know, without giving like direct treatment advice, I can tell you um, from a PT standpoint, um, taking a look at that, seeing, you know, having an evaluation, is it extrinsic tightness, meaning is it your muscles, soft tissues, or is it intrinsic tightness from the device itself? So kind of getting to the bottom of why it can't bend first might be a, a starting point, um, possibly some PT treatment. Uh, a lot of times we'll modify, um, inside bike or stationary bike seat height to help with that or do revolutions in certain ways to help you get to that point. But I would say, I, I would say get an evaluation, see why it's not bending, see if it can bend more, or if it happened to be something with the prosthesis. Sometimes when there's instability in a knee, they'll put in a different kind of replace, replacement joint so that it provides more stability. So I would get to the bottom of why it's tight and, and get some individualized instruction, but hopefully there's some, there's some play there. Uh, we've had, we did study in, in our center and we were back at Penn. Uh, we looked at our patients with total knee replacement and even years and years after their replaced surgeries, they were able to increase their range of motion if they kept stretching over time. So their range did not come back right away. It might take uh, even more than five years of them continuing because, you know, range of motion going in determines range of motion going out. So if it was tight for a long time, it is not going to improve overnight. Thank you. We are at the top of the hour. So I just, if there's any final questions, please ask it now. Otherwise we will wrap up for the night. Any, any final words here? Yeah, I'd like to thank you for putting this on a little too late. I wish I would have uh, been here when I was like 35 or 40 instead of 73. 
But yes, thank you. And Angie, I don't remember even when we met, but it must have been 20 some years ago. Thank you for doing what you always do. <laughs> thank you guys. I really appreciate you coming on tonight. It was really fun to see your faces too. And thanks for participating. Yeah, Angie, thank you so much for being here and everyone who was able to participate and Lena, who, uh, by the way, is our director of education and also a physical therapist um, and at an HCC by training. So um, thank you all. I mean, I know that there we are a small, intimate group here tonight, but I think these are questions a lot of folks are facing and across the lifespan. So I'm so glad we were able to finally reach and connect with you, uh, Priscilla, so and others. So truly, thank you for being on. Again, there's one more next week. So please do join us and you'll get a deeper dive into um, the, the ultrasound, which will be really great and can ask more questions then. So we hope to see you next week. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your evening. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Bye.